my job today to bring the word of pleasure. I told Sister Sheila that I would say a couple of words. You have to fight with it through me, and I promise you I'll be anointed when I preach. <laughs> I lost my father four years ago in February. One of the hardest things is the first time that I ever got to preach in this church, my father was not alive. But a man who stepped in to be a father to me, even when my father was alive, and we weren't seeing eye to eye, let me sleep on his couch. And he fed me. Every once in a while, he let me wear one of his ties, and y'all don't know, he's funny about his clothes. It's good to see my brother Devin in the house. But he took care of me, not only physically, but spiritually. He became a spiritual father to me. And nothing I could ever do would ever be able to repay you. And on Father's Day, I, I don't celebrate Father's Day. And every year on February 16th, I have a bad day. And in January, not far after my birthday, my father's birthday, it's not such a great day for me. But today is Father's Day. I may not celebrate it for me, but I very much celebrate it for you. Because this man has poured into me more than any other man other than my father. He has taken care of me. He has chastised me, not in front of other people, but behind closed doors. And I appreciate everything you've ever done for me. I just want you to know that. Y'all give him another hand because he deserves all of it. Let's go ahead and stand for the reading of the word. I'm going to give honor and glory to my father-in-law today who's in the house. I'm so glad that him, my mother-in-law, could be here to support me. Appreciate each and every one of you. I'm going to read my word, and we're going to pray, and then I'm just going to cut loose. That's all right with y'all. Good. Uh, give, give me a Matthew 9, 20-22. It says, And behold, a woman which was diseased with the issue of blood twelve years came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. Brother, she said, Within herself, if I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. But Jesus turned him about, and when he saw her, she said, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Yeah. And the woman was. Go ahead if you want to follow on with 2 Samuel 6, 13 through 23, the New Living Translation. Uh, after the men who were carrying the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, David sacrificed a bull and a fatted calf. And David danced before the Lord with all his might, wearing a priestly garment. So David and all the people of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts of joy and the blowing of horns. But as the ark of the Lord entered the city of David, Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked down from her window when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. She was filled with contempt for him. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the special tent. David had prepared for it, and David sacrificed burnt offerings and peace offerings to the Lord. When he had finished his sacrifice, David blessed the people in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies. And then he gave to her every Israelite man and one and woman in the crowd a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins. And all the people returned to their homes. Now listen. Now when David returned home to bless his own family, Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet him. She said in disgust, how distinguished the king of Israel looked today, shamelessly exposing himself to the servant girls like any vulgar person might do. David retorted to Michael, I was dancing before the Lord who chose me above your father and all his family. He appointed me as the leader of Israel, the people of the Lord, so I celebrate before the Lord. Yeah. Yes, and I will, I am willing to look even more foolish than this, yeah. even to be humiliated in my own eyes. Yeah. But those servant girls you mentioned will indeed think I am distinguished. So Michael, the daughter of Saul, remained childless throughout her entire life. You may be seated. Lord Jesus, I ask you right now, Lord, to anoint me, Lord, anoint thy ears and hear. Lord Jesus, I ask you right now to have your way in this 
place, Lord. Whatever it is that you're willing to do, Lord, help me to get out of the way and let it be done. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. So we're in a series. I told Brother Don that I was going to tie in a series. I normally don't, but it kind of fit. The power of right believing. That, that's what he preached on this morning. And now my, uh, you throw my slide up there. I'll give you my, my title. Talk Back Church. <laughs> and I'm so glad he brought it up and mentioned it uh, in, in today. Uh, because he always tells them that we're not the first church in the Frigidaire, right. and that we're a talkback church. Yeah, right. I'm going to talk a little bit about our response today. Now, talkback is, is most of us see that, and talkback is a negative connotation. In other words, we don't want you to talk back to your, uh, your, your mom and your daddy. Yeah. And that goes the same for us. Obviously, uh, whenever he says a talkback church, that don't mean to be talking, checking your own phones. Whispering here and here and there and there. When you're a talkback church, we come into agreement with the word of God. And, and, and it's not in my notes, but I read it this morning. Do you know what amen means? You know, growing up in church, y'all always say, let's get amen. And everybody goes, amen. amen. Oh, I thought y'all me on my own. <laughs> but amen actually means to let it be so. Right. Let it be so. But it was more of a signal and a signage of the fact that we have now come into agreement together. Me and you, so like whenever Brother Don says that tonight, if you bring things, if you bring your body, bring your friends, bring your family, that whenever you bring them here to the house of God, he's already prophesied it in advance and said that things in your mind shall be healed tonight at 7. That's going to be the type of service it is. And you said, amen. That means you now are in agreement. You have now coupled yeah. together and you believe it. You say, you're ready to go. Sometimes I don't always tell my testimony. We always don't want to be wrapped up about who we used to be. 
You know, you get a little, a little nice clothes and a little preaching in you, and all of a sudden you don't want to talk about all the time that you did drugs and all the time that you were poor and all the time that you traded, you know, and I had to borrow the $5 bill to, to feed my son. We were living alone in the Quincy, and I had to tell him that I, I didn't eat because I was already strung out, but I had five bucks, and that's all I had, and I spent it on Happy Meal. Come on. We don't want to hear about that. But unfortunately, that's where we're at sometimes, and that's what she was at. That's right. And one of the best things about being a talkback church is, is you can just get that white believing. You can just understand. Amen. I can just pull right up on side of the road. I'm about to back here, and I say, you know what? That old boy said he can get off drugs. In October, he's been clean for six years. Yeah. And, and there he is up there preaching to us about what, but if I could just believe. All right. If I could just say amen to that. If I could just say amen to that. You know, maybe my issues may be big right now in my mind, but if I could just pull on side of and say, you know what? Amen. And it didn't have to be loud because you know what? She said it to herself. Right. Now the crowd may have been boisterous and things have been going on, but she came right up into herself and said, you know what? That's possible. That's right. Right. You gotta That's possible. That's why we were overcome by the word of our testimony. And every time we stir up the fact that God did it for me, He can do it for you. And we start calling out those He is healed from stage four cancer and all that. The reason why we belabor the point. And I know some of y'all probably sick of hear, hearing about Brother uh, Victory. Right? Y'all won't admit it. But when you're on your own struggle, when you're sick in your body, and all of a sudden all we hear about is Brother Victory this and Brother Victory that. The flesh wants to tell you, you know what, that's just brother's name. That's just him. That's just because Brother Don believes in him and all that. You start to negatively prosper yourself. In other words, all the negativity starts to grow on the inside of you. And you start to believe the enemy for poor. Well, you're never going to be healed. You're never going to be saved. You're never going to be healed. And all of a sudden now, you've aborted the miracle. Come on. You've aborted the miracle because you didn't take the time to be a talk back church. You didn't take the time to say, you know what, Brother Victor got to heal that. Michael should have been worshiping God, being right. excited. 
about it. Like everything else. But the first thing she could do is just tear down David. You look silly down there. Oh yeah, I bet you was doing it for all the other little girls. All right. I bet you was doing it. And the problem was that she didn't realize that David, his part, was after God's heart. And he was trying to be everything that God wanted him to be. Because he remembered being back in the shepherd's field. All right. Being anointed king, but still having to tend sheep. And he understood that if I could just praise him, if I could just put him first and put it, the right response for David's anointing was to dance before the Lord. Yeah. Right. Come on. Unfortunately, we have Michael in our life. And I'm trying to tell you right now, if you put on the identity of Michael today, the problem is, and the reason why I read the last verse in there, the last time you ever hear about Michael, the daughter of Saul, it tells you that for the rest of her life, her womb was dried up. Come on. And I'm trying to tell you right now, in this moment when God's presence and the things of God are coming into your life, the right response will get you everything. But the wrong response will take away the life that you give. Everything you try to do is give up and it will go away. What are we responding to? Come on, come on. Negativity only makes negativity. I can't tear down Zelodiah and make me look no better. You know what it makes me look like? It makes me look like a fool and tear people down. That's all it does. can't put out your life to make mine brighter. Come on. It don't work that way. The right response in the right situation will get it. I heard, I was listening to a message this morning and it just came to me. But but the widow woman that went to Elijah and said, and said you know, my husband dead, we ain't got no way to make it. He said, all right, what do you got? She's got a little cruise of oil. All right. He said, well, if you can go out, go out to all your neighbors and borrow up vessels. Yeah. All right? Now, you got to understand, they went out, they didn't get bar vessels. They didn't go to their next door neighbor's house and say, you got a pot. I just need a pot. Their response in the situation to the Holy Ghost moving in their life was, I got to go out and I got to get all that I can get a hold of. You understand, they went to every neighbor they could go to on foot. They tried to find every little pot, every little bowl, every little thing that holds something. They went out and got it and said, when they didn't have any more vessels, that's when the oil stopped. Do you understand that they were taken care of for the rest of their life on the response that they went out and got all, all they could get? Sometimes you come up in here and you hear me feel the Holy Ghost move. They say come down for prayer and when you come down here, you're not honest. Half the time the ministry team might even know that you're not honest. You come down and you ask for God to pray for your foot, but the whole time you got a broken heart. But you don't feel like you were good enough to go out and get all the best. What God's trying to feel up to me, you don't have to leave here, folks. You don't have to leave here. Uh, He's not the God of just enough. He's the God of more than enough. He can't talk about pressing down and shaking together when you come with your little baby cup. Come on. Come on. Right. You remember that song? We all grew up. Fill my cup, Lord. Yeah. Yes, Jesus. Yeah. 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 But unfortunately, that's not how not for that little widow woman. It wasn't feel my cup. It was like, you got a baby poo? Uh, next one <laughs> there, you got a baby poo? Can I borrow your baby poo today? You got to understand something. And this goes for your neighbor. All right? It ain't even in my nose. But neighbor, whenever Brother Lee comes over here and says, you know what? I'm in a bind right now, but I feel like God's about to fill up something in my life. Yeah. I feel like God's about to do something major in my life. Brother David, what can you do for me? What else can I do? Uh, I'll pray for you. I'll do whatever I can. I'll do whatever I can because Brother Lee needs another pot. All right. Uh, right? I have to become in agreement with Brother Lee. I have to say amen to Brother Lee's situation. In other words, I have to give him the empty pot that I have. All right. The only way that I have an empty pot is if I'm pouring out into something. Come on. Come on. Your response in your situation is how it's going to be. Do you understand when Moses went up on the mountain, the children of Israel didn't even have enough faith to believe God after they had already crossed the Red Sea. All right. When I come down, they were down there worshiping some golden idol. All right. Their response cost most of them their lives. That's right. Anytime that God is moving and trying to do something in your life, some of you got calls on your life, some of you got things in your life that you know you want to do so very bad, but most of y'all only got that little baby 
you fuck, and every time you come, you get a touch, you feel like that's just enough, and you're trying to go out in the world and fight against things that, that need a five-gallon bucket, but you got that six-ounce cup. All right. And then you get discouraged. Yes. You get out there and feel like God abandoned you. But when you came down here, you were supposed to empty out all the trash. All the things that he didn't want you to have, so he could fill you all the way up. So yes. the next time that you went out there, and you could come out there instead of a water pistol, you come out there with a fire truck. Come on. You're trying to put out the fire with a little cup. It don't work, right? The fire we don't throw up in your house. When your house is on fire with a little water hose, it comes out there with that big old hose. And it comes out there with enough force. That's what God's trying to pour into your life. Oh, the right. response that you give is what's going to depict your future. All right. I want to kind of slightly but surely reference uh, two of the greatest Bible teachers in the New Testament. And an eye of fire. They didn't have a whole lot to do in the New Testament, but they taught us a valuable lesson. When faced with the need for the church to be givers, they responded with lies and deceit. Yeah, all right, right. Yes, that's right. Now, sometimes we think that that'll apply to us, but whenever the spirit starts to move in, in, in the, the church, but every time he talks about the food bank, every time he talks about doing outreach, and every time the word goes forth, and we're trying to reach everybody we can reach, the need, the need is supposed to be met with provision. Not met with deceit and lie. Yes, Lord, I believe that He gonna do it, but we don't sow nothing into it. All right. We don't plant no seed, and every once in a while we pass by the pastor's vision in the garden. We pass by, we notice there ain't no little sprouts in it because we ain't plant no seed. All right. But I'm trying to tell you that every seed that you plant, God waters, and He always gives the increase. Hallelujah. So whenever the new church was met with the need. They came with lives and deceit. And for it, they paid with their own lives. Yeah, that's right. And they became one of the greatest Bible teachers. You didn't hear about it after that. And the rest of the New Testament, you ain't never heard nobody lie to the Holy Ghost again. When it came down to today, nobody ever showed up and said, you know what? Uh, I know you said we won't give 10%. That's my time, my 5% temple offering. And I know anything above that's going to be the blessing that I get. And I'm going to give this, this is it. And then I'm going to tell you right now, everybody who ever did that and walked away like this looking back, just making sure they were still good. Uh, just making sure I'm still where I'm in the Word, right? I'm in the Word. All right. The response that we're getting is what's going to be what's next. All right. When the priest's word goes forth, sometimes it doesn't resonate within our spirit because it creates something that lets us know that we're not quite 100% what we said we was. All right. All right. And then the first thing your flesh will tell you is condemnation. They know what you've been doing. They're talking about you. And you feel it like I'm pointing at you. Right. Half the time, though, your flesh will tell you it's condemnation when it's really God just pulling on your heart saying, if you would just give me that, I'll fill it with the anointing yeah, yeah. that you yeah. desire. Yeah. Yeah. If you would just empty out your vessel. Of all the junk and all the trash and all the things that you've made of God in your life, if you would just let me have my spot back, I'll write right. everything. Let me tell you something right now. Some of you got such a great anointing on your life, but you stuffed a bunch of trash in the whole yeah. thing, and that's going to cover up what you feel on the inside. And I'm sorry, it is not going to cover up. That's all right, all right. Yeah, right. The reason why we fill our hearts and our bodies with drugs, alcohol, sex, promiscuity, Adultery, all these things that are sins and all these things that are against us. The reason we fill it up is because we have a God-shaped hole in our life and we don't understand that the only thing that's ever going to fill it is God. And we keep trying to shove trash in there until our bodies wither away, until our minds bring the peace to And all of a sudden, you don't understand that that hole is only going to be filled with God. And your response is what's going to fill it. God is a gentleman. He will not run up on you and point you in the chest. Yes. Yes. Right. That's right. I made me think of a funny when we were here one time with a, a visiting an evangelist kicked this guy in the chest. Yeah. Y'all remember that? It was right here before he fell out. I was off. Awesome. I, I thought that was great. <laughs> <laughs> is your faith lifted today? Do you understand that what you do matters? Somebody feels like what they do don't even matter. Like they just kind of go with the flow. You can't find that in the Bible. No. You ain't gonna find that scripture in the Bible that says you just go with the flow. 
understand that the response that you give, even if it's telling yourself like the woman with the issue of love, if I could just be close to the Maybe I may not come down to the front, but if I can just say to myself right now, Lord, you see where I sit, it's good enough that I'm here in this room, and because I'm in this room, I give myself to you. I say that I am no longer bondage to sin. I won't do it. Lord, I know I may stumble and fall, but I turn my back on it, and because I turn my back on it, I know that you're going to bring me out. Because it's worth it. Come on. 